Thank you. <laughs> I guess this is a uh, seamless transition from fossil fuels to uh, renewable energy. And I guess uh, a day like, an uncomfortable day like today uh, reminds us of the urgency of that uh, transition, at least it does for me. Um, so I presume this audience does not need much of an introduction to the solar PV industry. Um, we all read about it a lot in the papers. Uh, for those of you who are coming to Stanford from other parts of the US or other countries, uh, also chances are you're going to read a lot more about it uh, when you get here. Not only do we have uh, a couple of the major solar companies in our backyard, uh, but perhaps equally important, uh, many of the corporate heavyweights in our area have recently uh, made and continue to make major investments in solar power. Uh, that includes companies like uh, Google, Apple, and also our own Stanford University that decided fairly recently to make a major uh, investment in solar to satisfy the electricity needs here on, on campus. Okay? So uh, perhaps here's a graph that I think uh, everybody has seen in some form or another. Uh, that's sort of the title of the talk, the uh, rather phenomenal growth in solar PV worldwide over the last 15 years. Uh, and if uh, I hope also the ones in the back can sort of see the different colors clearly. Uh, basically, uh, on the bottom you see Europe, which took an early lead in this but has leveled off recently. Um, but nonetheless, uh, this is a very steep, very convex curve in which basically the Americas, and that means largely the US at the moment, and Asian countries are, have picked up the slack that has been created. Okay, so here is, uh, just to reinforce this a little bit, what you see on uh, the left are annual installments of new capacity in 2014 alone. Um, you see the US has sort of moved into third place there with about six gigawatt. That accounts for actually about one third of all new capacity installed in the US last year. Uh, so solar accounts for that at this point already. Um, countries like Germany have slowed down and we can sort of talk about this a little bit, why that's happening. Um, but uh, perhaps the biggest story other than the US is uh, China, which in the past has been a major producer of the hardware, in particular the solar PV modules, um, the panels, if you want to, those, uh, that country now also is installing them at an increased pace. In the past, they have been largely producing them and exporting them to other countries. They still continue to do that, but now you have them also as a country that installs solar power. Okay? So what I would like to talk to you about in the next uh, uh, 20 minutes or so is the question, how should we interpret uh, this growth story? Solar is still small uh, in terms of electricity generation altogether if you look at all electricity generated, but the growth rates are pretty phenomenal. And then the natural questions are, what, has been, what have been the drivers of that growth? And is it likely to continue if we sort of extrapolate from what we know at this point? Uh, that is, is this trend sort of here to stay? So that's something I've been working on over the last couple of years, and I want to give you sort of some a feel for the work that we have been doing uh, at the business school in this area. Okay. So uh, several sort of uh, what, what you may call drivers or explanatory factors are being mentioned frequently in terms of uh, what's behind this growth. Um, perhaps first and foremost, uh, technological improvements and cost reductions really at every level of uh, the value chain from modules uh, to uh, the costs that are being incurred in installing uh, solar systems, uh, including labor hours at the very end that it takes. Uh, companies have reorganized themselves in this industry. Uh, that would probably take me a little longer to, to explain, uh, but there is a, a lot in the way of vertical integration of companies that before sort of operated separately. Uh, another aspect is financial innovation. We're seeing more and more a model in which uh, the parties that are consuming the solar power, uh, the off-takers, if you want to, are no longer the owners, uh, but we have third-party ownership. Uh, and many people or companies nowadays lease their solar panels, uh, and that has uh, led to a new sort of set of innovations that ultimately also have helped to reduce uh, the cost of capital uh, in this area. Okay? And finally, and this is really what I want to uh, focus on the most in this talk, uh, 
uh, for the US in particular, but also for some of the other countries, notably the European countries, um, public policy support in the way of tax incentives. Um, so in 2009, uh, US Congress authorized a 30% investment tax credit. Uh, what that basically means is if a company or an individual has a tax liability, you get a 30% break or refund on this uh, if you make a uh, corresponding or an eligible investment in a solar facility. Uh, in addition, there are ways to write off these uh, investments in a faster way, so an accelerated form of depreciation, which once again lowers effectively the cost. And those are the two main things at the federal level. And then in addition, we have seen uh, in different US states really movements in the way of renewable portfolio standards, which basically provide incentives, quotas, if you want to, for renewable energy. Um, and related to that here in California, the California Solar Initiative, which was basically just a cash rebate to new investors in solar. All of these things have uh, contributed, uh, at least in the US, but also similarly in other countries, to the boom in, in solar power. So the interesting thing then is sort of to sort out what are really um, the major drivers here. And in particular, when it comes to the federal investment tax credit, one thing to note is this has a uh, sunset provision such that at, by the end of 2016, uh, the um, investment tax credit for corporations is scheduled to go down from 30 to 10%. And for individual homeowners, so for non-corporations, it's supposed to go away in its entirety. So as you might expect, the solar industry is lobbying Congress very actively and saying, you know, don't let this happen. So the question that we have sort of uh, have been looking at and I want to share with you a little bit is what would be the impact if that really does happen and what are also possibly alternatives uh, to what's currently on the books in terms of the tax laws. So in particular, I want to look at three questions here. Where are we in the current environment when it comes to cost competitiveness of solar? Um, and I want to sort of look at this at a slightly more granular level here going by individual states. I have picked a sample of five US states which collectively uh, account for about two thirds of all installations in the US. Um, and then also by segment, uh, so I mentioned earlier some of the big players here, those typically invest in what's called utility scale uh, facilities. Uh, but much of the growth actually has come either at the commercial level where individual companies put solar panels on the rooftops, say, of their warehouses or their office buildings. And of course, the last segment being the residential segment, individual homeowners and individual rooftops, okay? So let's look at these separately and then also by state. So that will sort of provide, a, if you want to, a grid of measures of cost competitiveness. So that's sort of an assessment that I'm going to give you in a moment. Where are we now? Uh, or where are we going to be very shortly? Um, and then the question really from a public policy perspective, if Congress were not to change its mind and lets the investment tax credit go down from 30 to 10%, what would be the impact on cost competitiveness at that point in time? Um, and as the very last thing, if I get to it on time, um, perhaps sketch an alternative scenario that would, rather than stepping this down in one big step, uh, gradually uh, reduce that public support, that investment tax credit, hoping that in the intervening years, the industry continues to innovate and reduce cost, and we would sort of maintain the current status of cost competitiveness. That's sort of the idea. And we can sort of quantify this um, you know, relatively easily once we have sort of the, the first pieces in place. Okay, so what's the way to measure cost competitiveness? Um, there's a uh, metric in the industry uh, that's not used just for solar, but really across different uh, energy platforms. In fact, one of its advantages is that you can compare say the energy generated from, say electricity generated from a nuclear power plant versus a renewable source versus a coal-fired power plant. And what you do is um, you basically calculate a unit cost measure, which in this industry is called the levelized 
cost of electricity, or also levelized cost of energy. So roughly the way to think about this is um, an entrepreneur, a company that asks itself, should I invest in solar or some other type of electricity generation source? What would I need in overall revenues per kilowatt hour over the whole life cycle of this facility, say the next 25 years, so that at the end of this process, I'm breaking even on this investment. It's a decent investment for me, okay? So basically what you're comparing is a stream of revenues at this levelized cost and your, uh, that must cover, uh, uh, and you get a stream of revenues uh, at this levelized cost and that must cover your actual uh, cost in terms that you're incurring both initially when you make the investment and on an ongoing basis. So conceptually you can break this into three components, one being the fixed operating cost for solar on an annual basis, maintenance replacing certain parts that are giving out over a number of years. The big component is this unit cost of capacity. That's basically your overall systems price that you're paying initially and you must sort of distribute, that's where the word levelize comes in, levelize that cost over the next 25 or 30 years, uh, whatever your assumption is. And then the third thing that we need uh, in, in those types of calculations is the, are the tax considerations, because that's where public policy, investment tax credits, and all these kinds of things come in. So fortunately, you can represent this in a somewhat separable fashion, where you can take this tax factor, think of this as a markup, somewhere around, say, 1.3 for conventional, but much, much smaller for solar, that sort of um, acts on this cost of capacity. Okay, just to give you uh, a flavor of this. So here are some numbers. Um, this is, I'm already fast forwarding the tape a little bit to 2016, because remember 2016 is the year that things are supposed to change. And this is my grid. In the rows you see, um, the five different states, and in the columns, the three segments. And within each cell, if you want to, I have three numbers. One is the cost, the levelized cost of solar on a per kilowatt hour basis in the current environment, or in 2016, if we still have a 30% investment tax credit. So that's where the subscript 30 is under the LCOE, okay? Contrast this with what I call the comparison price, that's sort of what solar needs to beat in order to be cost competitive. And then the third um, column has what this levelized cost at the end of 2016 would be if Congress doesn't change its mind and the investment tax rate really drops off to 10%. Okay. So what do we get? Uh, well, let me first say the comparison price differs greatly across the three segments. And the reason for that is simply if you're building a utility scale facility, say a utility itself builds it, pretty much what you have to compete with are wholesale prices for electricity. Those of course are much, much lower than retail prices. Conversely, if you're a company, what you have to, and you ask yourself, should I put solar panels on my rooftop? The relevant comparison is, well, what does my energy service provider, possibly the utility, charge me, our business on average, per kilowatt hour, so I need to beat that, okay? Uh, that's still lower than what individual households uh, you all will be paying when, you, when you're here. Um, I guess Stanford takes care of, for, I've heard of many for you, but it doesn't for me. So I pay roughly 16 cents, 16.5 cents per kilowatt hour here in California. That's sort of the retail, average retail rate in PG&E, Pacific Gas and Electricity Territory, okay? So, what do we take away from this? Well, in the commercial and residential segment, solar is in the current environment, that is with the current incentives, it is pretty competitive in many of uh, the states. New Jersey is always difficult. We'll talk about New Jersey separately, perhaps in a moment. But in the others, it's pretty much uh, there. Uh, say if you look at California commercial, you know, that's a sizable difference. Um, we're sort of projecting at the moment a levelized cost of 10 cents, but it costs the business on average 15 cents at the moment. So that's part of the explanation why we have seen this boom. It makes sense for a lot of parties to do these kinds of investments. Okay. Um, 
an exception to what I just described happens over here on the utility side. There you see, if I compare the levelized cost at the, in the current environment against the comparison price, that is wholesale prices for electricity, basically we're out of luck. Generally, the comparison prices in all of these states are lower than our calculations uh, for what solar accounts for at this point. So, but nonetheless, we have seen phenomenal growth in these markets. What accounts for that? Well, that's where we get to the state level incentives. Um, states have been running their own programs. As I mentioned before, renewable portfolio standards, uh, which if we get back to the example of New Jersey, have become at some point incredibly valuable. But that was really sort of a particular thing to New Jersey at some point. Uh, okay. Now, what would happen if, once again, the investment tax credit were to drop off and go from 30 to 10 percent? These are the numbers in red, and I've marked them in red just to indicate for you, and you can verify it immediately. There, we're basically underwater across the board uh, by a pretty sizable margin. So the conclusion is, uh, even if things improve a little bit here in the, in the coming years, uh, costs are going to fall a little bit, and that's already baked into those numbers for 2016. If Congress doesn't change its mind, um, many of us, and I, I agree with those assessments, are predicting that there is a serious cliff for the solar industry coming unless uh, the states were to step in and increase the state-level incentives for, for solar in this environment. So that leaves the question then really, what to do about this? Um, is there, what we have is a overall a dynamic in which things have been going a lot better for solar, costs have been coming down. Congress at some point in the US and also in other countries um, jump-started the industry. It has worked out exactly the way it was intended, but the timing is off a little bit here because um, at this point, the cost reductions that have been achieved are not yet sufficient to sustain the industry without the public support. Okay. So that's where we are on this. Let me spend a moment here talking a little bit about um, future cost reduction. So if we do not just go to 2016, but we're mapping it out, try to map it out for another, say, 10 years, all the way to the mid-20s. to the mid -20s. Can we do that? <laughs> well. That's something ultimately sort of a forecast here, um, looking at past observations and past improvements that we have to do if we want to sort of inform policymakers on this. And that's sort of our goal with this line of work. So this here is a well-known chart in the industry. It was first presented here at Stanford in a seminar in 2011 by Dick Swanson, who was the founder of SunPower, one of those solar companies here in our backyard. And all he did <coughs> was um, graph, really, plot prices against uh, production volume in this industry. So think of this as total uh, megawatts installed. And both on both prices and uh, quantities, that is megawatts produced, are on a logarithmic scale. But the thing that's stunning about this curve is um, it fits beautifully, as you can see in its logarithmic form, it's almost a straight line. And there was this little blip here that was typically attributed to um, a change uh, or a shortage of polysilicon a number of years, but then things got pretty much back to that curve very quickly. So when that was presented here in 2011, you know, people were saying, this is spectacular. You know, we came from $33 per watt to a dollar to $1.81 in just um, those 30 years. But this got to end. This has to level off. Well, here's what happened uh, ever since. Um, here's pretty much the curve up to 2010. This was the last graph. And this is what has been happening in the last um, three to four years. If you, by now, we also have some of the 2014 data and this has sort of held steady in the first part of 2014 and recently has sort of fallen off again. But the important thing to take away, we have actually now beaten sort of this 80% learning curve. So things have gotten even faster uh, than what was predicted, even though people were worried that ultimately this industry would slow down. So 
That, of course, raises the question, well, what's happening here? Another thing that has been happening is there has been a lot of um, entry into this industry from China, largely, which have Chinese players have really upped the capacity in that industry. And so people have been trying to say, well, perhaps those price reductions are not so much a question of cost, but more a question of price pressure, because this industry expanded too quickly, and people got into too, uh, had sort of too rosy expectations in terms of making those investments. So that's something that, in terms of the research we're trying to do here, is to um, disentangle this and try to really divide to what extent are the prices that we have seen a consequence of continued cost reductions, and to what extent is this really a function of uh, basically excessive capacity for the industry for a number of years. Um, if you do that, you basically get sort of a new line here, that's the green line. That is a prediction of what we call an economically sustainable price. This is what the industry would have charged based on the cost figures that we have examined if there had not been sort of too much optimism and people wouldn't have jumped in too quickly into this industry, okay? So you put all of this together uh, and you do something similar over on the so-called balance of system cost. What I just talked about was just the module part. And you get to the following consideration in this, and this is then where I'm going to wrap up. Um, there is good reason to believe that costs, not just prices, but also costs, are going to continue to fall at a particular pace that's pretty impressive. But as I tried to indicate early on, by 2016, we're not far enough on this learning curve. So this raises the question, could you do something more in between? That is, could you say, well, in 2016, we're not going to step down the investment tax credit from 30 to 10%, but we're going to go somewhere in between, my red line here. And then you would play this one more time for the period 2020 to 2024. And then ultimately you would go to zero. So the calculation here is in terms of taxpayers and Congress as a proposal. Um, you give the industry a little bit more in the next five years when it really needs it. But on the other hand, there are reasons to believe it doesn't need all those subsidies, the continued subsidies at 10% investment tax credit and accelerated appreciation forever, because the, ta the tax code at the moment says those remaining subsidies will be in place forever. So there's, in my mind, a possibility of a deal here to be made where the industry gets a little bit more now when it needs it, but you're cutting it back to zero in the very long run. And that works out if you do the numbers. Um, I think uh, Lee showed to me that I'm sort of out of time. Let me just leave this graph here. I know this has a lot of colorful bars, it looks a little bit just like the uh, physics experiment, but uh, think of it this way. If on the red line we see what the investment tax credit, these are again levelized cost for California at a utility scale, this is what would have happened if the 30% investment tax credit had remained in place. The alternative, put solar, uh, basically makes it uncompetitive for a number of years. And the alternative path that we're sort of sketching here would basically mitigate this. This is sort of what you, what, what I call the phase down scenario, where you're sort of seesawing your way, but you're remaining with those purple curves pretty close to the comparison prices, the black line, which are the forecast wholesale prices in the state of California, which basically those types of investments would have to be, would have to beat. Most importantly, the projections for 2025, if at that point you took all of this away, we're projecting that in another 10 years, solar at this scale would really reach grid parity. That is, if you took all the incentives away, both federal and state, uh, it should be able to beat those prices that are forecast for 2025. Okay. So that was a quick tour of some of the work that we're doing uh, over at the business school. And uh, largely, as you could see, a cost policy and economic angle to renewable energy. So I'd be happy to entertain some questions. Two questions. I guess I stepped over time. Uh, great. Hi uh, there. Wondering under a uh, ICS uh, phase scenario that you talked about, mm -hmm. wondering from your perspective, which would be a preferable state incentive to complement that, whether it would be RPS or feed-in tariffs or some other method? 
Um, if, if I had the magic wand and I got to choose this, I would always go for basically what the California uh, Solar Initiative did, which was cash rebates. I think those are the cleanest uh, to supplement these things. Um, obviously a short answer to a complicated question. Uh, over there. That's a good point. And uh, so we have in all of this sort of basically been, I've been listening to my engineering colleagues, um, 25 years is sort of the usual framework. That, but I've also heard people say that there is after 25 years likely to be still a considerable residual value. That makes the numbers a little better. But on the other hand, from an economic cost perspective, uh, because you discount the future, uh, you know, what you get in those last five years between years 26 and 30 isn't really worth all that much anymore. But nonetheless noted, this can change things a little bit on the margin. And I've heard some people sort of say when things looked a little dire that they were banking that ultimately it would actually be longer than, uh, than just 25 years. One more? <laughs> Good. Hmm? Yeah, and have to get out of that fan here. Yeah, go ahead. What was the thriving industry in California? But this is a general concept of what thriving Chinese investment in uh, some of the other countries. Mm -hmm. Yeah, good point. Uh, obviously, uh, I've been focusing on the US, California in particular, because California has been also proactive, and that's why we've seen a lot of growth here. Different countries have adopted different policy support mechanisms. Um, Germany, the feed-in tariff that was mentioned a, a moment ago, Spain had those also for a number of years. Um, I think there's an active debate, you know, which of these mechanisms are more effective. But one thing that we're clearly seeing in Germany at the moment, when I showed you the second slide, um, Germany first jumped on the gas pedal, now really went off it because it cut back those um, feed-in tariffs. And the consequence was Germany has really slowed down now. Uh, in terms of these things. So basically, in all the countries in which we have seen sort of fast growth over the last couple of years, there has been some kind of, uh, not necessarily a tax mechanism, but another policy mechanism in place. Solar on its own, even under ideal conditions, does not seem to be able to do this yet. Okay, okay. so let's thank uh, mm -hmm. Dr. Lachestein.